Right, so we're going to continue our, our discussion of proteins. And today, we're going to change a little bit and discuss not so much what a protein is made of, because we did that last time, but what ways can we put proteins together? And I don't necessarily mean how many different combinations of amino acids there are. That's not, not a math problem I'm after. It's how many ways can they fold on themselves, right? So we're talking mostly about the tertiary and quaternary structures of proteins, right? If you don't remember what primary through quaternary means, go back and look at the, the definitions we went over last time. But the, the tertiary and quaternary structures, the overall shape of the protein, right, can adopt many different shapes. So let's think about something simple first. What would be the simplest possible shape that a, a soluble protein, a protein floating in the in water environment, could possibly take? What's the simplest shape you can think of? Mine? Right, if you're saying something, I can't hear you. A straight line. A straight line. Straight. Well, that, that's pretty simple, um, and that would require a very, very short peptide sequence, right? But even if it's more than just two or three amino acids long, it's likely not to stay in a perfectly straight line, right? Because none of the bonds are linear, right? There's no triple bonds in it. So they're all tetrahedral. Right. So can we think of a, a simpler shape that a longer protein would take? Triangle or circle? Okay, keep in mind these are three-dimensional objects. A sphere. A sphere, exactly. So something round, right? So a, a sphere. It's a three-dimensional shape, and it's the simplest shape you can adopt. And because anything more than a sphere would have complicated architecture to it, right? So a sphere is very, very simple. It has one parameter, and that's its radius or diameter, right? And that's it, right? So what does the adoption of a spherical shape accomplish? What, what's a feature of a sphere that's unique to spheres? doesn't have any angles say that again it doesn't have any sharp angles it doesn't have any sharp angles in fact it has no angles at all right what, what i'm thinking about here is the the two things of an object it can have a volume and it can have a surface area right so in the, in the shape of a sphere you accomplish the the minimization of that ratio right so the surface area to volume ratio is as small as it can possibly be for a three-dimensional object or if you, if you want to memorize it as a volume to surface area, it's been maximized, right? The most amount of volume, the most amount of stuff in the smallest containing surface, right? However you'd like to think about it, just know that it takes the minimum amount of material to paint the surface, but I've maximized the interior space for that area, right? And any other shape you can think of would not have a smaller surface area to volume ratio. And this is why things normally adopt spherical shapes. If you've ever blown uh, soap bubbles, right, and they're floating around, they adopt a spherical shape. It's slightly off of spherical because we are in a gravitational field, but if you were to do it in a zero gravity field, it would adopt a perfect sphere, right, because it minimizes the surface area to volume ratio. Right? We don't have a perfect sphere for these proteins, uh, but they have a general globular shape, we call it. So it, has, it adopts the, the generic shape of a globe. And if you have this shape and it's floating or sitting in an aqueous or water environment, what amino acid would you expect to be on the surface interacting with the water? Polar amino acids? Polar, good answer, right? So polar ones, uh, you may also think about charged ones, right, which is the extreme of polar. And if you take about, talk about those collectively, you'd call them hydrophilic amino acids. Right? Or amino acids that, are, that have no problem or favorable binding with water molecules or other polar molecules. What about the hydrophobic amino acids? Would they be buried down in the center of the protein to get away from the solvent, away from the water? Right? And that's generally what happens when you make a protein. This isn't the only option, but this is the simplest option. Right? So the hydrophobic amino acids are buried in the center of the protein to be with each other in their hydrophobic interactions, not very strong interactions, but they exclude water very well. And the hydrophilic or charged or, or, or polar ones are going to be near the surface or are facing the solvent. Does this mean that all hydrophilics are on the surface and all hydrophobics are in the core? No. 
that you can have hydrophilic amino acids in the core. You can have hydrophobics on the surface. Of course you can. But the majority of the ones on the surface will be more favorable interaction with water, hydrophilic, than the ones that will not be interacting. Right? This is just a general rule. It doesn't mean all of them are. Right? If there were no hydrophobics on the surface, then you wouldn't have proteins binding to each other very well. Okay. Let's take this idea of... I have, a, I have a quick question. Okay, go ahead. When you're referring to globular proteins, are you still talking about the spherical ones mentioned above it or a different category? No, that, that's what globular means. It means globe-shaped or spherical. Okay, thank you. Again, they're not perfect spheres, but they have this, this general round shape. Right? They may have protrusions here and there, and that's what makes them functional. Um, we'll talk about all those little pieces later, but they have this overall uh, globular or round shape. Right? It could be a football shaped, or it could be a soccer ball, or it could be you know, something that's more like a banana, right? but it's still a globular shape. It's not long, thin filaments and, or anything like that. Right? We'll talk about those in a minute too. Right? Let's take our globular protein and think about turning it inside out. Right? So let's put all the hydrophobic amino acids that we can on the surface and all the, the hydrophilic ones down in the center. Right, so I've kind of flipped it inside out, if you think of it. What environment would such a protein be favored in? In um, organic solvents. Organic solvents, great, that would be true. Where are we going to find such organic solvent environments in the body? So where in the body would it be a non-aqueous environment, a hydrophobic environment? Fat. Say again? Fat. <laughs> fat. Yeah, that's true. The, in the fat globules in, in adipose tissue, that's true. You'd have an uh, inverse environment in there. I'm not going to find very many proteins in that. But where would you find one in virtually every cell? Um, in the coating of your skin to make it waterproof? So the, the coating of the skin may be on your nails where you have the, the, the waxes and so forth, but the skin is not necessarily waterproof. Um, if you've ever been in a pool a long time, you'll know that, right? But it does have a keratin layer on the outside, that's true. But I'm talking about more specific to a single cell. Where in a cell would you find a hydrophobic environment? The cell membrane? The membrane. Membranes, right. Not necessarily just the cell membrane, but membranes in general. Right, so the cell membrane, the ER, if we're talking about eukaryotic cells, the nuclear membrane, right, the Golgi, all these areas that have membranous surroundings right, or, or encapsulations. So yes, that's where you'll find these proteins. And so for proteins that are in these membranes, which there are quite a few of them, they generally have more hydrophobic amino acids on their surface and hydrophilics pulled away from the surface. Right, so it's kind of an inside-out environment. And this is very important to the cell. You need these in your membranes to communicate with the outside world, right? Or with other cells, right? Or to detect what's outside of the cell. So these are very important proteins. Right? And then finally, let's consider one that's not spherical at all, not even close to spherical. Let's go back to that first answer of a straight line. Imagine a protein that's as stretched out as it can be, right? It's going to be in this long shape of a fiber, we call it. Right? And of course, we name them fibrous proteins. Right? And these proteins are, are not going to be very water-soluble at all because they're huge, long sticks. Right? They're not going to stay in solution very well. Even though they may have hydrophobic or hydrophilic things on their surface, essentially they're one big surface. They have no interior volume. Right? They're just a long, thin filament, like a wire. Think of it that way. Right? And these are usually, usually used to form something that wires are good at, at doing, such as, as filaments, right? They form things like hair, your nails, tendons, ligaments, muscles, right? Anything that's going to be a, a cable-like structure, and they're usually for holding things together, right? So they're very strong, much like cables are. And so that's how they adopt that shape. Okay, so we have globular, we have the inside-out globular ones, which are going to be called membrane proteins, because that's where they're going to be found. And then we have the really stretched-out proteins that look like wires. We're going to call those fibrous proteins, right? And you can probably find a protein that doesn't fit well into any one of these categories. And that's very, very true. 
you're going to find one that may have a portion of itself stuck in a membrane and then in the outside portion of the cell where the rest of the protein resides it's just connected to that membrane portion it's a big globular piece and it may even have a fibrous piece on it right so you can find exceptions to this where a protein won't discreetly fit into one of these categories but these are the three types we can use to three definitions we can use to describe parts of proteins and so I'm not going to ask you, is this protein globular? Is this protein fibrous? Unless it's completely in that category. But you can recognize that if I showed you a protein, you can say, oh, this part of it sticking out of the membrane looks kind of fibrous, right? It's a long, thin filament. And the part in the membrane is certainly a membrane protein at that point. So you can identify the parts. And from that, you can probably guess their function. Right? And that's what we want to talk about today. Less so how the proteins are put together, but more of what are they doing once they're assembled? Once they're folded up into one of these combinations or one or more of these combinations, what's their job? What's the point? What's the function of that protein? And we can classify them uh, by their structure like we just did. We can also classify them by what they do. And you see, I've, I've generated 10, uh, you know, there's more obviously, but I just came up with 10 ways to classify proteins. Right? And there's many, many more you can think of, but here's some common ones, right? So are, are the protein, once they're folded up, is it an enzyme, right? So we can call them catalytic proteins. They do something as far as chemistry is concerned. They're not just structural anymore. And not all, not all proteins are enzymes. Some are, some aren't. So some will be in this category and some will not. We have defense proteins. We'll talk about those today. Our immunoglobulin, globulins, also called antibodies, right? Uh, we have transport proteins. They're going to carry things around for me. We're going to talk about these today as well, like hemoglobin and our lipoproteins, which carry lipids in the blood because lipids are not water soluble. They're going to need someone to carry them around. And that's what these lipoproteins do. And it's kind of listed in their name. They're proteins that carry lipids. Right? We have messenger proteins. These are, are our, our protein-based hormones like insulin, glucagon, uh, growth hormone. They send signals from one cell to another or one area of the body to another. So they're small, usually, mostly uh, globular or spherical type proteins, right? Very small things that you can go from one area to the body, usually through the blood, right? We have contractile proteins. These are proteins that perform a chemistry like the catalytic ones, but a very specific one in that they move with respect to each other, right? They change their shape upon some chemical motion or chemistry provided the, the energy for some motion. And you've heard of this in muscle contraction like actin and myosin movements, right? We have structural proteins, right? This is the one that doesn't do very much other than it provides some, some scaffolding or a, a construction upon which other things can hold on to, right? So we call them structural, but they're still serving a purpose. Its function is rather mundane, but it's necessary, right? So collagen, keratin, those type of things provide uh, materials or cables that hold you together, without which you would fall apart. Right? You have no way to, to make use of that contractile muscle unless it's attached to a bone right? or another or, or piece of tissue, and you move it with respect to something else. So if it's not attached to anything, the contraction means nothing. Right? We have transmembrane proteins. So these are not only membrane proteins, but they go all the way across the membrane. That's what trans means, across. So it goes completely across the membrane, and that's a mechanism for getting things across the membrane that would not normally diffuse across, such as very large things or very charged things, right? Or things that, that are unable to cross because they're bound to something else that's larger, right? So we mainly make pores and ion channels and all sorts of pla places you can cross a membrane, and they're generally very selective about what they let across. So they, you know, they, they, they have an interior feature that's not just folded up and it's a hydrophilic core there, but there's a channel that goes through that's very selective about what it lets through. Other times it's not so selective. It lets many things through, right? And we'll talk about a few of those as well. And the eighth category here, um, and again, you don't have to memorize these categories. I'm giving you examples, and you probably could come up with 10 more on your own if you wanted to. Um, storage protein, so these are gonna maintain or concentrate or store something for me, right? An example would be myoglobin, very similar to hemoglobin, we'll talk about it, Hemoglobin is for transport of oxygen. Myoglobin is more for storage of oxygen. And as the name implies, myoglobin is going to be in the muscles, or the myocytes. And it's just to store the oxygen until the cell needs it, right? Which is, for muscles, immediately, right? It rarely stores a lot of it. So it needs a continuous supply 
from the, the transport proteins, and we can store it uh, at, at least temporarily in the muscle with myoglobin. Right? Ferritin is the way we concentrate iron, which should make sense from the name, for the Fe, for ferritin. So we concentrate iron this way. So when your muscle cells, or sorry, when your red blood cells are uh, in their last days and they're, they're going to be retired soon, we want to recover the iron. And it's often stored in the form of ferritin until we give it to the next uh, hemoglobin molecule. Right? So it's a, it's a storage form of iron. There are many other storage uh, proteins as well. We have regulatory proteins. These are the ones that we use for cell signaling, right? From one molecule to the next, this is, or sorry, one cell to the next. This is much like our messenger proteins, right? So you could probably throw all these regulatory proteins with the messenger proteins in the same system. Right? So these are the messenger carriers, and these are the one that receives the message. This is kind of like the mailbox for your message. Right? So they're the cell receptors on the surface or inside that receive the message from someone else. Without them, the messenger is really pointless. Right? You can't deliver the message if there's nowhere to drop it off. Right? And then the last category I threw in here, just so I could have 10 for some arbitrary reason, was nutrient proteins. And these are proteins that are basically food for the, the organism, but it's stored in a form that lasts for a while. Like this is canned food, think of it that way. So this casein in milk is a protein that's used for the, the, the newborn offspring, right? Because it's a mammal feeding the, the offspring, but the mother's milk. And the casein protein is broken down by the new infant and it's a, a source of food, right? It's a way of transfer, transferring proteins from the mother to the child. Right? And it's in a very stable form of, of milk. Right? And ovalbumin is, it's, is a very similar uh, idea. This was just found in eggs because these aren't mammals anymore. And it's a way of storing some, some proteins in the form of ovalbumin, it's a very stable protein, uh, in the egg for the developing chicken or, or alligator or whatever laid the egg. Right? So it's a way of concentrating protein in this, this little uh, vessel called the egg that's going to serve that organism as it develops before it hatches. And then it's gonna to have to find food on its own. All right, so these are nutrient proteins and they both serve the same purpose, just in a different way. All right, so let's look at some of these uh, proteins and what we can do to them. All right, so the, the easiest thing to do to a protein is two different reactions. All right, so we put all these amino acids together, we made a protein, it may or may not fold up on itself into different shapes and have a different purpose. But we can do two main types of chemistry to these proteins. We, and it's the same type of chemistry we're going to do to nucleic acids later. We can take those and denature them, right? Completely unfold them, disorder all that stuff, right? However the, the structure was put together, if it was globular or straight or uh, inside out or whatever it might be, we completely unfold it. And it's just a long floppy filament of amino acids, right? That's what protein denaturation means. And you've done this before if you've ever cooked an egg, right? What's happening is these proteins that are in the solution of that egg, that, the, that ovalbumin I was talking about back here, right, is unfolding when you heat it up, right? When you heat up a molecule, it, it moves around more rapidly and the protein loses all of its structure except the primary structure. It's still held together. All those connections between amino acids were covalent bonds, right? They were amide bonds, the peptide bonds. But anything of higher order, secondary structure, alpha helices, beta sheets, tertiary structure, how it's folded up on itself, and even quaternary structure, if there were more than one chain there, all that's going to get disrupted if you heat it up, right? Especially if you're cooking an egg, it's quite warm, right? It's never going to get that hot inside of the organism. So you heat it up, all the proteins fall apart, and of course now the hydrophobic amino acids and the hydrophilic amino acids are going to want to interact with like structures, and many of the hydrophobic ones are going to clump together from different strands, and you get this thing falling out of solution. It precipitates. And that's why your sort of soluble liquid egg interior becomes a solid, right, when you cook it. It's not because you're removing all the water. You are boiling away a lot of the water, that's true. But all the proteins are falling apart, right? They're, they're denaturing is what we call it, right? Disordering all the levels of structure beyond primary. But the primary is still intact. The protein is still the same amino acid sequence from start to finish. You haven't broken it. Right? And that's the other thing you can do to proteins. We can do addition of water right, to those uh, peptide bonds. Usually you're going to need an enzyme to help you out with that because they're fairly stable, thankfully, or we would fall apart if we ever jumped in a swimming pool. Right? So 
The, the water needs a little enzyme help to break this bond called hydrolysis. We've seen this before. We add the water and it breaks the amide bond into its two original components. We did this with esters once before. Right? You get the carboxylic acid and the amine back. So the amino acids are pulled apart. Right? They're, they're chemically broken. And so if you do denaturation, you disrupt all levels of structure except primary. It's still all hooked together in the same order it was before. But if you do hydrolysis, you disrupt all levels of structure because you're disrupting the primary. And basically you have a soup of amino acids when you're done. All right, so this is what happens when you digest your food in your stomach and your small intestine. You're doing hydrolysis with these enzymes. You've heard of trypsin and pepsin and chymotrypsin. These enzymes, which we'll talk about later as well, are digesting your proteins. Right? They're, they're breaking those amino acid to amino acid bonds, those peptide bonds. Right? So this, this hydrolysis is generally irreversible. It's not going to spontaneously go back together and form the protein again. But the protein de denaturation is often irreversible, very often irreversible. For a few very small proteins, like insulin, for example, right, or other really tiny proteins, if you denature them, and then you slowly remove the denaturant, maybe Remember it was the heat, maybe right behind you? your microphone's open. Uh, maybe it was the heat, maybe it was the, uh, the pH that you changed, maybe it was the amount of salt you added, maybe you added an organic solvent, whatever it might be to cause the denaturation. If you slowly remove that thing, like drop the temperature really slowly, like one degree every few minutes or something, or if you change the pH slowly or remove the salt or denaturant, it may refold. Most proteins won't, but some do. Excuse me. Okay, so let's look at these two proteins, hemoglobin and myoglobin. We talked about these two briefly a moment ago. Hemoglobin was one of your transport proteins, and myoglobin is one of your storage proteins. And they both transport or store the same thing that's going to be molecular oxygen. Right? How does it hold on to the O2? It uses an iron atom, which generally has a charge, right? It's one of these, these iron ions. And it's held by a heme group. Right? And we'll look at the heme group in just a minute. Here's another picture of it over here. And it's called a, a tetraporphyrin ring. I'll show you a picture of it in a slide coming up. But it just holds the iron there for me. And the iron is where the oxygen, or O2, molecular oxygen, is bound. These two proteins, hemoglobin, has four different subunits. Right? So it does have quaternary structure. Whereas myoglobin is a single subunit. It doesn't bind to any others. So this has no quaternary structure. We call it a monomer. So let's look at some similarities and differences in these two. Functionally, they do the same thing. They both carry oxygen. You can think of hemoglobin as four times the size of myoglobin. These are not to scale with each other, obviously. So you can see each subunit of hemoglobin in a different color here folds up a lot like one myoglobin does. Right, so these represent alpha helices in here. It's almost all alpha helical, right? There's just no beta sheet. There's a few turns and loops and so forth. And it looks identical to this one, right? This one's just turned upside down with respect to this one. But you see that they look identical to each other. So hemoglobin is essentially four myoglobins put together, but it's not. It's not the same sequence. So let's go back and look at their primary structures. Remind me what primary structure is again. We said primary was simply the sequence of amino acids start to finish in order. So if I look at the chain of myoglobin from one end to the other, from its start to its end, and I list out the amino acids, and I compare that to one of the chains of hemoglobin, right, whether the alpha or the beta chain, right, any, either one, it looks nothing like myoglobin. Right? They have similar lengths. Right? It's about the same length of amino acids, the same number of amino acids, but in no way are they, they match in order, right? So they, they look almost nothing alike in their primary sequence, except for the total number of amino acids is similar. It's not exact, but it's similar. But if we move up to secondary structure, we see that they've all, they, form, they fold the same way, right? This has eight alpha helices all bundled together here, right? This is all alpha helix bundled together, as are the other chains here. So despite having nearly unrelated primary structure, right? The sequences aren't, don't look the same at all. They fold up in very similar ways. So this should tell you that there's more than one way to achieve that goal.
right? And these aren't the only two. There are many others, right? Other ways to achieve the same fold, we call it, right? So this fold is achieved by that sequence, but it's not the only sequence that can do it. There are many sequences that can adopt the same fold, right? And then if we move up to tertiary structure, we see that if we put all these together, it has this general globular shape again, right? It's not quite spherical, but it's kind of a, a, a round thing. Right? And I don't mean it's a long filament, it's certainly not. It's, it's all folded on itself. It looks almost the same as this one. Right? And each one of these looks the same as the others here. These two are identical and these two are identical. Right? So it's, it's definitely the, the, the consequence of folding into the secondary structures, all these alpha helices, and the way the alpha helices interact with each other also interacts the same way in hemoglobin, so you get nearly identical tertiary structures. And they all have the same prosthetic group, right? All have the same cofactor, we call it. We'll talk about that more when we talk about enzymes. But they have this prosthetic group, which means it's not made of amino acids. It's acquired after or when it folds. And it has the functional part in it that holds the iron, which holds the oxygen. Okay, and then if we look at quaternary structure, we said this once, that the hemoglobin has quaternary structure. There's two alpha subunits and two beta subunits that gives it this heterotetramer arrangement so four subunits two alpha two beta and hetero indicating they're not all the same they don't all have to be different but not all the same and myoglobin does not have quaternary structure it is simply called a monomer right it's only one chain okay right, so keep that in mind just because something has a similar sequence doesn't mean it folds the same way and just because something has different sequences doesn't mean it can't fold the same way. So keep those two statements in mind. Okay, so let's look at uh, how hemoglobin develops over the course of human development, starting from when you are uh, just a fertilized egg until you're an adult. All right, so all along the way, we change our hemoglobin. Right? It's not the same molecule throughout your development. All right, so here's the, the two glob globin clusters that are found on chromosome 16 and 11, respectively. And the way, the way this works is, if this is the DNA, right, this is from 5' prime to 3', prime. this is the direction of DNA in the chromosome. And this is on a separate chromosome, chromosome 11, right, here's the sequence, from which these genes are derived. So the, the amino acids in hemoglobin, right, the alpha and the beta subunits of hemoglobin, right, are originally coded for in the DNA. Right? We'll talk more about transcription and translation later. But the information to assemble those amino acids is encoded in the DNA. Right? And so this, this region of our, our chromosome 16 has the information for the alpha subunit, and this region of chromosome 11 has the information for the beta subunit. And we call it the alpha and beta clusters because there are many versions of alpha and many versions of the beta globin. Right? So I blew this up for you just to show you that there's separate ones. And if you don't know your Greek alphabet, you're going to learn a few more letters here. This is zeta, right? And then what I'm concerned about in the alpha cluster, and the reason it's called alpha cluster is because the adult version of it is the alpha version. There's some others ahead of it, like the zeta. And in the beta cluster, there's quite a few, right? We end up with beta as an adult, but there's also a delta, also a gamma, and there's also an epsilon, right, early on. Okay, so I'm going to move this, I'll make it a little smaller and show you what I want to uh, talk about. So here's that same picture so you don't lose it. Let's talk about, as you develop here in this picture, which hemoglobins your body uses and why. Okay, so let's start very early on. Right? So if you're, you're a, uh, a human or a, uh, any other uh, mammalian organism that, that's going to have a, a fetus growing inside of the organism for a while, you need to supply it with nutrients, right? It's usually done through the blood, right? So early on in the first few weeks of, of development, there is no blood, right? There's no blood vessels, there's no heart yet. So you don't have any hemoglobin produced yet, right? You're, you're more worried about dividing your one to two to four to eight to 16 cells. You're not so worried about making hemoglobin at this point uh, because all your nutrients can easily diffuse through the very small number of cells you have. Once you become a larger organism, you've got a few hundred to a few thousand cells now, the, the oxygen can't just diffuse through the, the cells anymore. You're a thicker organism now. So you need some way to transport it throughout your body. 
right? So you start making these hemoglobins, right? And your blood vessels start to develop and the heart starts to pump blood, which is around 21 days or so. So around three weeks or so, you start making these hemoglobins and the first ones made are the first ones in the cluster. So for the alpha group, you make the zeta type alpha globin. And for the beta type, you make the epsilon type beta globin. Okay, and of course these bind to one another, two zetas and two epsilons form a hemoglobin, much like the adult one. Except this one doesn't last very long. It transports blood, or, and uh, transports in the blood, sorry, and transports oxygen around to the tissues, but it only lasts a few weeks, and, that do, and then they start, stop making those. They are almost immediately replaced by the next one in the list. So the zeta becomes the alpha, right? There's two different versions of alpha, but we're just gonna go from zeta to alpha, all right? And then once you do that around the, you know, five, six weeks of age, uh, post-conception, you continue making alphas for the rest of your life, you know, so even past the, the point of birth here, right? And then the time after birth, all the way for the rest of your life, you will make the alpha part. So that was fairly mundane, right? You start with zeta very, very early on, and within weeks, you change to the alpha component and make that one the rest of your life. So that one's kind of not very, very unique, right? It doesn't really do much for you. The important one is the beta cluster. Okay, so this one's where we're going to get our important features of the fetal hemoglobin. So we start out making the epsilon very early on. As you see, it declines rather rapidly in the first few weeks after it's made. And it's replaced mostly by the gamma cluster. Right, so this is the gamma one. You see it's, it's made for the rest of uh, the pregnancy. It only starts to decline just before birth. Right, the beta one is made. Right, you get a little bit of the, the delta one starting to be made as well. But mostly the beta here right, is made. And it, it only starts to decline just before birth. So near the end of pregnancy. So we start switching from the epsilon immediately to gamma. And about a... a 80-20 or 90-10 split between making gammas and deltas very later on and betas. So delta is only made very, very late. And beta is only made uh, in a low quantity until near birth. Right? And soon after birth, within a few weeks after birth, the production of beta actually exceeds the production of the gamma subunit. Right? So they switch places here. Beta is higher than gamma at this point. This is several weeks after birth. And then for the rest of your life, you make mostly beta and the gamma and deltas generally are made in small quantities, but very, very little for the rest of your life. So very, very small amounts, maybe 10% at the most, right? Whereas the, the alpha and betas are the majority of the proteins you're going to make for the rest of your life. So what's the point? Why do we wait until we switch here? So let's look at this figure on the top right. If you're, you're a pregnant woman, you are supplying all the oxygen to the fetus. Right? It's its only source of oxygen delivery is through the umbilical cord by the mother. Right? That's it. So once you're beyond a few cells, you have to deliver the oxygen by vessels. Okay? And so if the mother is, is making all the, the deliveries of oxygen, should the mother's hemoglobin or the fetus's hemoglobin have a higher affinity for oxygen? Who should bind oxygen more tightly? The mother's hemoglobin or the fetus's hemoglobin? Mother. So if the mother's hemoglobin binds oxygen more tightly, could it transfer it to the fetus? Yes. If the mother's hemoglobin binds oxygen more tightly, it doesn't let it go as easily as the fetal hemoglobin does. It's going to extract it from the fetus. Whoever binds more tightly gets it. So who should bind it more tightly, the maternal cells or the fetal cells? Fetal. The fetal, of course, right? Because only in the place where you present the, the blood, which goes across the placenta, through the umbilical cords, right, into the fetus, only at that point where you have competition for the oxygen. And the fetal cells should win, right? The fetal hemoglobin should bind more tightly to extract the oxygen from the mother's hemoglobin. Otherwise, you'd never be able to deliver it. Right? So why not make fetal hemoglobin, which binds oxygen so much better? You see it's a higher point on this graph at every point than the blue line. Pick any percentage of oxygen, the red line is higher than the blue line. Right? Of course, once you get to 100%, it, they both, both bind very well. Right? But it's always above the blue line. So no matter what amount of oxygen the, fetal or the maternal hemoglobin is carrying, the fetal hemoglobin will always be able to extract it. 
right, to acquire the oxygen, which is the point. So why not make fetal hemoglobin your whole life? It binds oxygen better than adult hemoglobin. Why don't we just make this alpha-gamma combination, which is the one that binds more tightly, the rest of our lives? Why do we switch? You'll never be able to carry a baby. Yeah, for, for males, that wouldn't be a problem, right? So if we made alpha 2, gamma 2 the rest of our lives as males, no issue, right? We would bind oxygen very well. But for, for an adult female who would potentially want to have a, another child or a, a child in general, then you have the same hemoglobin as the fetus. And now you have an equal proportion of affinity and it's not an efficient transfer. So that's the reason for the switch. Right, so soon after birth, we switch to making the beta one, which works very well. You notice it's not a huge difference between the two, but as an adult, it's just enough that you still transfer the, the oxygen to the fetus instead of having it a poor transfer or an extraction. Right? That's why we have the switch. Why do males also do it? Because there's no need to. It's because it's simpler to have every organism from that species do it than to have a, a gender switch. Right, a switch for one gender, not the other. So it just does it for both, right? I have a quick question. Uh -huh. um, when you're, ever, could you explain really quickly what the difference is between alpha and beta? Like, I'm kind of confused. Okay, so let me go back a slide real quick. So alpha, this this hemoglobin, unlike myoglobin, is made up of four different subunits, right? There's four different protein chains coming together. So it has that quaternary structure two of which are called alpha and two called beta. We went over this last time, you know, it's got two of one type and two of another. That's all this means. We happen to call this one alpha and this one beta, right? It's got two of each, that's all that means. When we look at development uh, along the way, there's more than one alpha type, right? We're gonna call this whole thing of chromosome 16, the alpha type. So all of these, the zeta or the alpha or the psi, one which we're not really discussing, but zeta and alpha, they both work as the alpha subunit, right? They both take the, this position in this tetramer. Does that make sense so far? I could replace alpha with yes. beta here. Yes. I could also replace beta with either the delta or the gamma or the epsilon one. It has more options, right? And if I replace the beta subunit with one of these others, it looks almost identical to it. There's a few amino acid changes but it would also make a functional hemoglobin. I would take two of, two of cluster A and two of cluster B, right? It would make a functional hemoglobin. That's all I'm saying. So as we're developing, we choose or we make different versions of that beta or second half of the protein, right? We make mostly epsilon early on, very, very early, and then switch immediately to making gamma really quickly. And then over the course of the, the pregnancy, we make mostly gamma, the beta is slowly climbing until right after birth, we switch. Well, it's not really after birth switch. It's, you can see there's a continuous trend of the gamma down and the beta up. It's just now it's mostly beta about six weeks after birth, but it was already in this trend of, of switching. And then after you know a few weeks of after birth, you're making mostly the alpha 2, beta 2 type, which is the adult version you'll make the rest of your life. Does that make sense? Did I not answer your question? Oh, yes, no, sorry, that makes sense. Okay, and the last thing on this slide I wanna point out is where are the, the hemoglobins made, right? The hemoglobins are made in a, in a cell, right? At the, at the ribosome, and those cells are gonna become red blood cells, right? So, but early on, you don't have bone marrow yet to make those red blood cells, because that's where your red blood cells are made in hepatopoiesis. Uh, but before you have bone marrow, in fact, before you have bones, right, you just have cartilage at this point. So it's, it's made mainly by the liver from the, the point which you have a liver, right? So early on, you don't even have a liver, right? You just use the ball of cells. So the, the yolk sac ends up making a lot of these early ones, right? And then you start forming a liver fairly early on within about 10 weeks. And then the liver starts making blood cells. So the liver did a lot of jobs during your fetal development that is then taken over by other organs. Right, so the liver is kind of your most important organ, you would say, during development, because it can do the job of any of them, or almost any of them. Uh, but then it it's, relieves those duties to other organs, like the spleen starts making some for a while. And then once you have bone marrow developed, 
the cells that were making them here migrate to that bone marrow and start forming a colony there, and you make it in your bone marrow the rest of your life. Right. This is why a bone marrow transplant can transfer the, a different type of, of, of blood group or uh, immune system, because it's where all these cells are made, to another person, right? Because you need these cells that can generate those raw materials. Okay, so here's hemoglobin and myoglobin. This is very similar to this graph I showed you up here. Right, so let me remind you what this graph was here. This was between the mom and the fetus. The mom cells, the hemoglobin, her alpha 2, beta 2, binds almost as well, but not quite as well, as the fetal version, which would be alpha 2, gamma 2. Right, we just replaced beta with gamma in the fetus at this point. Right, so the fetal hemoglobin always binds slightly better than the maternal one. That makes sense. If we look at an adult individual and compare their hemoglobin, which is, of course, alpha 2, beta 2, to their myoglobin, right? This is just one subunit. It's neither alpha nor beta. It's just one subunit. It doesn't have quaternary structure. Right, it's a completely different protein from hemoglobin, but it has a similar overall shape, and it carries oxygen just like hemoglobin. But if you look at the comparison of these two, which one binds oxygen far more tightly, hemoglobin or myoglobin? Myoglobin. Maya. Myoglobin. Myoglobin is far higher at every point on this curve than hemoglobin is. I mean, this is the saturation. How tightly it binds is how high it is at any partial pressure of oxygen. So looking back, we said the fetal one was always higher than the maternal one, but not much along the way. Right? It mirrored it just a little better along the way. Here, myoglobin is by far better than hemoglobin at every step along the way, especially in the low concentrations. So what would happen if you had oxygen uh, on a hemoglobin and it were next to a myoglobin? It would transfer. Since this binds it so much more tightly, what would happen? It would, it would suction it out? Yeah, that's a good way to say it. It would, it would transfer it, right, from the hemoglobin to the myoglobin. Where do we find myoglobin again? In our muscles. So this is transporting hemoglobins, transporting oxygen in the blood. And as it goes through the blood, of course, the O2 pressure starts to drop as it's dumping it off to more and more tissues. So down here, even when you're at low pressure, this is as your, your blood is coming back after going through all the capillaries and coming back to the heart and the last tissues it's going through, it can still transfer to myoglobin in muscles it's passing by to dump off the last bit of oxygen very well. So myoglobin has no, no problem extracting oxygen from the blood because right? it binds it so much tighter. Is hemoglobin going to be able to extract oxygen from the muscles? Is, is oxygen going to be able to flow the other direction? Is hemoglobin going to be able to take oxygen from myoglobin? If, if the concentration gradient changes, yes. So the concentration of oxygen here could change, but at any point along this thing, draw a vertical line, and myoglobin is still higher at every point. So there's no way hemoglobin can take it from myoglobin. Right? Any vertical line you want to draw, that's the different oxygen concentrations or pressures, myoglobin's always higher. Same reason that the, the maternal hemoglobin will never extract oxygen from the fetus. Our, our muscles will never give up their oxygen back to the blood, which is the point. We're going to use it in the muscles. Okay? Here's a picture of how it's held with that tetraporphyrin ring. Right? So these four five-membered rings you see in the corners here, I've highlighted one here. These are called porphyrin or pyrrole rings. Right? And there's four of them, so it's a tetraporphyrin. Right? And they're held together by these one carbon bridges. You see these four here are holding these four rings together. And in the center, we have an iron being held by the four nitrogens. Okay, so this iron is being held by these electronegative atoms, the nitrogens. We could put a different element here, maybe not iron, maybe another metal, and we'll see that near the end. Uh, but this is a metallo uh, protein now because it contains a metal, right? And this one's job is to transport oxygen, right? You see there's lots of other pieces here, like these carboxylic acid groups, right? There's a couple vinyl groups here. We've got some methyl groups here and there, right? And these are what, how the protein holds on to this thing, right? So this is buried.
in this protein, right? And all these little groups you see, here's that carboxyl group, here's the other one, right? Here's those vinyl groups. They're being held by amino acids in a little pocket, right? Just like this here. So a little pocket here is holding on to that, that prosthetic group, we call it. And in the center of it, we have an iron. Right? So what I want to do is take this, this molecule here, and I want you to imagine in your head rotating this thing 90 degrees away from you, right? So draw a line across the page here through the middle and act like it's on a swivel. And I'm going to rotate it so this top piece folds away from us and these vinyl groups at the bottom come towards us out of the page. So this ring is going to become nearly flat. Does that make sense so far? So imagine, imagine this ring being turned so that it's, it's flat from our point of view. Another way to think about it is if you were in the plane of the page looking at it from the bottom. Right? So if I flip this back, it should look something like this. I'm turning it so it's looking at it on edge. All right? Everybody follow what I did there? All right? So all the top groups have now been folded backwards. They're behind the iron. We can't see them. And the ones at the bottom have been folded towards us. You see they're in front of the iron now. So I'm looking at it edge on. And you see it's not perfectly flat. It's not planar. Right? So this ring, although it looks flat on the page, is not quite flat. Right? It's got an angle to it. The iron is not perfectly aligned in the middle. It's off by a very small distance, by like half a hydrogen atom off. Right? So it's very, very tiny here. Right? Underneath the iron, this is what you couldn't see on the previous one, there's a histidine. Right? There were the four nitrogens in the ring. Here's a couple of them you can see. Right? There's four blue ones in here, and you can't see the others. They're behind stuff. But then there's another fifth position behind the iron holding it as well. Right? And this is made by a histidine amino acid. This is part of the, the hemoglobin molecule itself. Iron, with it, its, its state here, will make six associations, six bonds. Now, I know that's more than the four we've been used to with carbon, but iron's not in those first few elements. It's farther down. It's in the transition state metals. So it can make six bonds rather easily. So iron is going to make six connections. Four of them are the the four to the nitrogens in the ring, there's going to be one below it and one above it. You can't really see it in this picture. So if I show it this way, there's one below to the histidine, and it's waiting to make one above. And when O2 shows up, it makes that sixth bond. Right? And when it does so, it pulls this iron more in line with the ring. You notice this 0.4 oxygen that is below, it moves up to nearly planar with the ring. Not quite, it's a little off still. Very, very small displacement but it's almost planar with the ring now. And that's much more stable. And that's why this holding oxygen is a very stable arrangement. Myoglobin does it even better, right? It makes it perfectly planar with the ring. And that's why it holds it better than the hemoglobin. The fetal hemoglobin, of course, modulates, holds this ring a little differently, and it makes the oxygen bind a little tighter. That's the rationale behind those. But oxygen still doesn't make it perfect in hemoglobin. There is a molecule that, if I put it here in place of O2, makes it perfectly planar. It holds on to it so tightly, it's never going to let it go. What would that molecule be besides O2? What might bind here that you've heard of that will never let go? Right, it's very Carbon similar. Monoxide. To, say again? Carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide, or CO. Right? If you want to draw the Lewis structure of it, you could, right? because you're, you're versed in doing that now. So instead of O2, it's a C and an O. Instead of two oxygens, it would be CO. And it still binds through the O of the CO. Right? So same number of atoms, still two, but this would be a carbon instead. Right? But when CO binds here, it's a slightly different geometry. And it puts that nitrogen, sorry, the, the iron surrounded by all those nitrogens. Here's the four in the ring the one below, and then the oxygen from the CO above, it makes it very, very stable, very planar. And so basically the CO will never come off. And that's bad news because it's not delivering oxygen and it's getting in the way of the ability to deliver oxygen. And that's why CO can cause asphyxiation. Okay. All right, any questions on hemoglobin and myoglobin before we move on to our antibodies? All right, so let's talk about antibodies here. You've probably heard of these before, right? Another name for them are immunoglobulins, right? That should give you an idea that they're sort of globular in shape. They're not perfectly spherical at all, but they're not filamentous and they're not membrane proteins. So they have a, a sort of soluble round shape, but not perfectly round, of course. They look more like the letter Y than anything else, right? So these are, these are proteins 
that have carbohydrate groups on them, right? So if I, it's a protein chain, it's actually four chains hooked together here, right? So it's got this really long chain here, right? This is called the heavy chain because it's, it's more massive, right? And here's the light chain over here. It kind of looks like the top part of the heavy chain, but it doesn't have the bottom part. That's exactly what it looks like. So we call this one the light chain, but this is from the amino terminus to the carboxy terminus, or so start to finish. Amino terminus to carboxy terminus, indicated by this. Then we have another copy of it over here, a heavy chain and a light chain. And they're all held together by disulfide bonds. Okay, so these are, these are cysteines forming a disulfide linkage between this heavy chain and this light chain, this heavy chain, this light chain, and between the two heavy chains, there's one. So we got a series of disulfide bonds holding these four protein chains together into this structure. Right, so this is how it has that Y-shaped structure. Right, and the top part here, the part where the beginning of the four chains are, has the, the site, it makes a little pocket here that binds to the antigen. So antibodies bind to antigens. Right, that's what this means. So an antigen right, is a particular group of molecules or, or atoms arranged that this particular pocket recognizes. Right, so antibodies made by us, those are proteins, right, bind to a foreign agent called an antigen. It may be a foreign protein, it may be a piece of a virus, it may be a bacterial cell, it may be a lipid, it may be some drug you, you're taking. Right, so whatever it might be, it's the thing that the antibody recognizes. Antibiotics are drugs that kill bacteria, right, or at least harm bacteria. Right? It may, be, may not kill them but they're not antibodies at all. So don't confuse antibodies with antibiotics. Those are drugs designed to inhibit the growth of bacteria, right? So antibodies are proteins, and their job is to uh, make a pocket here, on both sides, that bind to a specific molecule called an antigen, generally foreign objects, okay? So let's look at the different types of antibodies we have. We have five different classes of antibodies. And here's that same Y-shaped picture down below, right? And here's a, a structural drawing of those five classes. And yes, I want you to know these, right? They're called IGs for immunoglobulins, right? Immunoglobulin. And then one of the five letters indicating the class. So it's G, E, D, M, and A, okay? So the, the G, E, and D all look sort of like each other, right? They have differences in their bottom portions. That's what makes these different. It can't, you can't see it in this drawing but it would be different since in their sequences down here, right? But the, the top parts could be the same on every one of these, right? The top parts could be exactly the same, right? But the bottom pieces will be different. So G, E, and D have slight changes to their protein sequences. Their primary structures will be different, right? They fold up similar ways, but these have just one. Just one of these little Y-shaped things is how these are arranged. M and A have multiple forms, right? So M forms a pentamer. Right, it'll be five of these Y-shaped proteins all bound together. So think of M as a, a immunological tumbleweed, right? So it's got, it's got pieces on the surface that can stick to things. And it's, it's that big round structure here. So it just rolls around until one of these sticks to something, which is a more efficient way to find something than only having it sticky on one end. Right, so that's why these are generally made first. IgAs can adopt all sorts of shapes. They can be by themselves like these, they can form dimers, which is the most common way to do it, or they can form a trimer, right, three of them. So IgA has some variability in its, its form. Um, IgM is always a pentamer, and these are always monomers, right? Now, by say monomer, I mean one copy of this Y-shaped thing. There's still four protein chains here, right, but one copy of it is put together. This one has five copies of that four-chain piece. And this one can have any number of copies of that four-chain piece, right? So structurally, that's what they look like. What do they do? Let's start with IgAs, right? So IgAs, that's this one that can have multiple shapes here, is the antibody found mainly in things that leave the body, all right, secretions. This is in your tears, and your saliva, in mucus, in uh, breast milk, in any, any liquid that leaves the body, sweat, right? It's found in there. There are IgAs in there, okay? And so my question to you is, is what's the point of an IgA as it's leaving the body, right? Why make an antibody that is outside the body? What's the point? To protect bacteria from coming in? 
Exactly. It's not necessarily just bacteria, but you're right. It could be any foreign thing, you know, bacteria, viral, a piece of nucleic acid, uh, some other cell that happens to be out there, a fungus, a seed, right? Anything that it would recognize, anything that this little piece would recognize, it'll bind to it. And because it's bound to it, it's got this big protein attached to it now, it's less likely to be able to enter the body. So that's the point. You're exactly right. So to bind things on the outside that we have seen before, because we have to have a, a code for this somewhere, a memory of it, and it's, it's secreted such that let's go on the offensive. Let's prevent that thing from entering the body in the first place. So it's one of our first lines of defense. It's also found in the colostrum, that first discharge of, of breast milk. So a brand new mother uh, is feeding their child for the first you know, weeks or two weeks. It's in this colostrum, which is the first discharge of breast milk. It is loaded in IgAs. What's the point of that? Protect the baby. Give the baby some antibodies. Right, but it's not going in the baby's body. Think about the digestive tract is still technically outside the body. It's a tube that goes through us. It's still not inside your body. So what's the point? They're not going to keep these IgAs. It's just going to go through that their digestive tract. So it is to protect it, but sorry, go ahead. Maybe put bacteria, like good bacteria into the um, like probiotics kind of, does it work like that? It's not a probiotic, of course, not a drug, but it's, it is to, to allow the, the colonization of the infant's gut, right? We want good bacteria there. We want E. coli there. We want the right E. coli there. We don't want all sorts of other things there because when the baby's born, the gut is essentially sterile, right? There's nothing in there. So it's going to be colonated immediately by all sorts of, of bugs. And we want the right ones there. And so how do we know which ones are the right ones? Well, the mother has already accomplished that long ago in her life, right? At this point, she's many, many years old compared to the infant. Her gut is colonized with the appropriate bacteria, and she's made antibodies to everything else. So those antibodies are given to the child in its first feedings to prevent anything else from colonizing the gut. Right? So it provides some immunity to the child in the digestive tract. Right? Before the child was born, it also received some immunity from the mother. Let's skip down to IgGs real quick and talk about that. IgG is by far the most abundant, makes up about three quarters of all the antibodies you produce in your blood. And it's the only of these five antibodies that is the only type that can cross the placenta. IgG is the only one that's able to cross the placental membrane. So the mother is also providing antibodies through the umbilical cord before birth, right? And then IgAs after birth. And what's the point of providing it before birth? To protect the baby from infection and to fortify the immune system. Right, so it protects the, the baby from any infection the mother might get. Because if the mother gets a virus or a bacterium or fungus or a parasite or something like that, but less likely a parasite, but a bacterial or viral, it could be transferred to the fetus because those cross the placenta easily, right? Many bacteria can and almost all viruses can. Right? So it, it can easily get to the fetus and the fetus has no protection. It has no memory of this infection at all. But the mother is sharing her, her immunological memory with this fetus as it's developing, right? But once you're born, those concentration of IgGs in your blood are no longer being replenished and of course they fall off. So in the first few weeks after birth, the IgAs are preventing the abdominal infections, but you're not being protected anymore, say several weeks after birth after the IgGs from your mother have fallen off because no more uh, placental connection, and you have to start making your own. So in the first few years of life, you're going to get sick. You're going to get sick with all these new bugs that you've never seen before. And because your mother's IgGs took care of them, and the IgAs took care of them while you were a fetus and then soon after birth, you have no memory of them. So when that protection from your mother wears off, you're going to get sick, right? And it's, there's nothing wrong with that. That's what happens. You're going to get all the colds you're going to get in your first few years of life, and you'll have lifelong immunity to it. But that's normal. And that's why kids are always sick, right? It's nothing you did wrong. It's, it's what's supposed to happen. Your, your immune system is learning, right? So the next one is uh, IgDs, which follows along from that statement. Once you have some sort of infection and make immunity to it, the way that immunity resides is often with IgDs. So these are B cells or B, B lymphocytes. These are immune cells or white blood cells that live in your 
your bone marrow and your spleen and your liver and your lymph nodes, they're everywhere, uh, but they're kind of in reserve. And they have an IgD, which is made from the IgG you initially made. We just changed the bottom part so this doesn't get released from the cell. It stays with the cell. And this cell is basically a library, right? It's a library of your previous infections. If you ever get that one again uh, and you detect the infection, your immune system brings pieces of the new foreign invader to the lymph node or the bone marrow or the liver, the spleen, wherever it happens to be. And it goes to all those places, actually. And it shows it to these cells and says, have we seen this before? And one of these IgDs wakes up and says, yes, I, I bind to that. I've seen that before. Make this. And we clear the infection before you ever know you've been infected. So very rapid clearance once you have these IgD memory cells. There is a virus that could destroy the IgD memory cells. I'm not going to ask you this on a test. It's just for FYI. If you get measles, right, which is very unlikely because you've all had the vaccine, uh, but the IgDs can be destroyed because the measles virus attacks those cells. So if you, if you get a measles infection, uh, somehow you're getting infected by the cold you've been immune to for 20 years, right? That can happen, right? So that's why it's not going to happen to you guys. You've all had the measles vaccine. But in the past, that was a problem. You kind of lose your memory of infections when you got measles virus. So that was my parents' generation and before that, right? Uh, IgG, uh, sorry, IgEs are the ones involved in hypersensitivity reactions, allergic reactions, parasitic infections. Uh, so IgEs are normally what are made to deal with parasites. These are larger organisms, you know, eukaryotic things, not bacteria or, or viruses, but fungus and paramecians and algae and amoebas and all the other different nasty looking parasites you've heard about. We don't have very many of them in North America. But because we don't have very many of them, your IgEs kind of get bored, right? They really don't get bored, but they have fewer things to do so they may become reactive to other things like peanuts, right? They think the peanut is a parasite because it reacts that way to it and you get hypersensitivity reactions to it or metals or allergens like pollen. So we get all these hypersensitivity reactions because we have very few parasites. If you look at areas of the world that are endemic for parasites, very few people develop allergies, asthma, or uh, hypersensitivity reactions to, to other things like peanuts. So we know this is involved in both and a lack of one tends to increase the occurrence of the other. So uh, immunoglobulin M is the last one in this list and it's the one that has this tumbleweed look with all the five parts that are sticking out and it's generally the first antibody made. So if you have a new foreign invader that you don't recognize by some memory cells, it goes to the library and says, nope, we've never seen this before, uh, start making new antibodies. So you make IgMs to it. They go out, bind to it fairly well, not excellently, but fairly well, bring back more pieces of it to other lymph nodes, and finally tailor the response in the form of an IgG. So these are kind of uh, going out and getting more information. Go bind more of this thing if it's there. Bring it back. Let's get some, you know, collect some information so we can make a better IgG. That's the point of IgM. So it's initially made first. You'll see a spike in IgMs during an initial infection. And then it'll decline, and the IgGs will be made much, much more abundantly and clear the infection. All right, so this is kind of the precursor, the, the uh, gathering information. All right, and this is your main foot soldier, the IgGs. E's are involved in the allergies and parasitic infections. D is involved in memory, and A is involved in secretions. All right, so it protects you from the outside, even in your gut. That's considered outside your body. Right, so this little chart kind of tells you everything you need to know about the five different types, and I want you to remember those things. Okay. And our last topic here will be lipoproteins. Right, so lipoproteins are proteins that carry lipids around. Why would I need that? Because lipids aren't soluble in water. So if you have a protein, at, or sorry, you have a lipid, and you want to transport it from one area of the body to the other, the best way to do that is through the bloodstream, of course, but that's mostly water. So you can't just dissolve in the water since you're a lipid, because by definition, lipids are not soluble in water. So I need some kind of taxi to carry me around. And that's what these lipoproteins do. And there are many of them, right? The main four we're gonna focus on are the ones I've listed below, right? So I call them chylomicrons, uh, very low density lipoproteins. That's what VLDL stands for. So very low density lipoprotein, low density lipoprotein, LDL, and high-density lipoprotein, HDL. And these very low, low, and high designations are very, very subtle differences, by the way. Uh, the density of water, right, pure water, is one gram per milliliter. 
So these LDLs and HDLs are just ever so slightly more dense than water. VLDLs are about the density of water, and chylomicrons are ever so slightly less dense than water. So these very, very subtle changes here right, around the density of water. And the reason these are different densities is because of their sizes. Right? So of these, if I said they all had the same mass, right, which they don't, but let's, for analysis here, let's just pretend they all have the same mass, the amount of matter in them. Which of these would be the largest? If they all have the same mass, which one would be the largest thing, largest in size? The chylomicrons. The chylomicrons would be the largest, right? Because they have a smaller density, right? Which is mass over volume, right? So if it has the same mass, but a lower density, it must have a larger volume because mass over volume is the density. So these are the largest particles, the chylomicrons. You'll see that in the slide coming up. And HDLs are the most dense, are the smallest, more concentrated particles. And these are in between, of course. All right. So I want you to know their names, their relative densities. You don't have to know these numbers at all, but know that these are the, the largest and least dense, and these are the smallest and most dense of the particles. And we'll see why in just a second. I'll explain it to you. All right. And in between are the VLDLs, so very low, low, and high. You can see the progression. Chylomicrons are the, the least dense but the largest of the particles. Okay. The other thing I want you to know is what they carry. These are lipoproteins or carrier proteins. They carry lipids. And I want, they carry lots of lipids, many different types. But I want you to specialize in learning one type for each one. So chylomicrons and VLDLs, learn those together. So chylomicrons and VLDLs carry mostly triacylglycerides. Right, we talked about those a couple lectures ago. This was a glycerol with three fatty acids stuck to it, mainly from our food. Right, so chylomicrons and VLDLs, the top two here, carry mostly triacylglycerides. Right, they carry other things as well, but I'm not concerned if you know those. Mostly triacylglycerides. Right, and then the other two I want you to learn together are LDLs and HDLs. And we're going to be concerned with their carrying of cholesterol. Right, so these two carry triacylglycerols, these two carry cholesterol. And all of them carry other things, but I want you to focus on those two. And then lastly, I want to focus on from A to B, from point A to point B, where do they carry their cargo? Right, so chylomicrons and VLDLs carry mainly triacylglycerols, and what's their destination and origin? Right, what's their cargo route? Right, so what's their paper route? So chylomicrons carry triacylglycerols from the small intestine, the food we get from the small intestine, they're not in the intestine, they're in the, the blood supply behind the small intestine. So the food is absorbed and then released into the vessels next to the intestinal cells. That's where the chylomicrons are. Right? So they pick up the, the triacylglycerols, not soluble in water again. They pick them up and bring them to the liver. Right? And if you guys have taken an anatomy class, right, you may have remembered that all the vessels that come from the small intestine, all those capillaries that run through there and pick up our foodstuffs, Right, coalesce into small veins, and larger veins, and ultimately to the hepatic portal vein. Right, so all those vessels that come from the small intestine, right, that are delivering or picking up food that we've eaten, must coalesce and go through the liver. You can think of the liver as the the customs or immigration for the body. Anything that enters through the intestine and, and is absorbed as food, it must or drugs or anything else, must go through the liver. Must go through customs first because we want to filter out anything that might be harmful. Right, so these chylomicrons run that paper route. They pick up triacylglycerols from the small intestine capillaries right, and bring them to the liver. At that point, they drop off their cargo at the liver. Right? These are like little uh, yellow taxis. Right? They drop off their cargo at the liver. They must now get back to the capillaries of the small intestine. But that's not an easy thing to do. That's kind of like driving around Atlanta. Right? You can't really just go back one exit on the interstate. It's, it's nightmare right so you got to find another way to get back you can't go backwards through the bloodstream and you can't go all over the body and hope to get back there they don't direct where they're driving right much like atlanta right so they have to find a way back so instead of using the major highways to get back we're going to use the surface streets right so we're going to get off of the, the blood highway and find our way back from the liver to the capillaries of the small intestine using the lymphatic vessels right our, our are small lymph vessels that go back. So these are very slow moving, one lane roads that take you back from the liver to the small intestine. So that's what our chylomicrons are gonna do. So they, they're in the small intestine, they pick up the triacylglycerides, 
They hop on the blood, go through the hepatic portal system, get to the liver, drop off their triacylglycerides, get off the highway, take the very slow moving one lane roads, the, the, the system that carries mostly white blood cells as well, back to the small intestine and then do that again. That's their only job. So if you find chylomicrons in the general circulation, like say in your hand, your foot, your legs, your, your brain, anywhere else, they shouldn't be there. They never leave this small circulation. So if you find chylomicrons outside of the intestine to liver, back to intestine by the lymphatic system circulation, then you likely have liver damage, right? Because they're not getting dropped off at the liver. They're making their way through. They missed their exit, right? So that's a good indicator of some liver, liver damage. Where chylomicrons left off is where VLDLs pick up. This is kind of like a relay race, right? So VLDLs pick up triacylglycerides from the liver and bring them out to the rest of the body, mostly to fat tissues, right? But to everywhere else in the body. So these two kind of have a relay race going on. These pick them up from the intestine, drop it off at the liver. They never go anywhere else. These pick them up from the liver and go through the general circulation and bring it to the rest of the body. And that's what they do. So they kind of have a two-part relay system. Okay. On the other side, we have LDLs and HDLs, right? And we said these are mainly carrying what we're going to be concerned with is cholesterol. And they do sort of the, the same thing, but it's not a relay race this time. They're going in opposite directions with opposite jobs. So LDLs carry the cholesterol from the liver, which is where cholesterol is synthesized, or if it's in your diet, it was brought there to the liver, right? These also carry that too, but mostly triacylglycerols, right? So LDL either synthesized in the liver, we make all the cholesterol we need in our liver, we don't have to get it in our diet, although the American diet says otherwise, right? And we take it from the liver and we bring it out to the rest of the body. The body needs cholesterol for lots of things. We talked about it. it's for hormones, for making the bile salts, for making uh, all of our, our estrogens and testosterones and progesterones, Right? We need all those things to make cholesterol, We are made from cholesterol. We put it in our membranes to help the fluidity of the membrane. So yes, we need to make it. We need some, but not the you know, multiple grams of it we get in our diet. So it's LDLs take it from the liver out to the rest of the body. HDLs do exactly the opposite. So HDL is like the, the package return system. Right? If you have a company you buy something from, this is the delivery. You we're delivering your cholesterol that you ordered. Right? And this one says, nope, I don't want it. I have too much. Send it back to the company. So HDLs transport excess cholesterol found elsewhere in the body back to the liver for degradation. Right? So you returned it, and they're going to recycle the material you sent back. Right? There will always be more LDLs than HDLs, just like any good company. You make more successful deliveries than you have returns. Right? So that's, that's the way this works. Okay? So let me show you that a different chart. So here's the same four chylomicrons, LDLs, LDLs, and HDLs, okay? So the chylomicron, we said, was the least dense, and it's only 2% protein. Protein is dense material. Lipids are not dense. So it's only 2% protein, and the vast majority of it is triacylglycerides, like I said, right? So it's a big particle. It's actually large enough to scatter light, right? And it floats because it's less dense than water. Okay, and the VLDLs, again, there's a little more protein, but not very much. It's a very low density particle, very low density lipoprotein, but again, carrying mostly triacylglycerols. It's still large enough to scatter light, but it's about the density of water, so it doesn't really float or sink, right? And LDLs and HDLs, clearly the amount of protein has gone up, so these become much more dense particles because amino acids and protein are dense things. Lipids are not dense, they tend to float. Right? Oil floats on water. So this density here is much higher. It's a smaller particle, and it carries mostly our cholesterols. Now, this one does carry more phospholipids than cholesterol. That's true, but I want you to remember these carry a lot of cholesterol and not very much triacylglycerides. These carry almost all triacylglycerides and almost nothing else. Okay? So I want you to remember it in those patterns. Right? This chart down here is just showing you where you can get uh, cholesterol from the body and how the LDLs carry it around. I'm not going to you know, reiterate that again. So it just shows you what these things are carrying and the direction if you want to see it in a visual format. Okay. In our last slide, we're going to talk about what we've already mentioned once, metalloproteins. Right. So metalloproteins are proteins that contain metals. Right. So we have three examples here that we've already mentioned. 
uh, one of them. So you have this tetraporphyrin ring one more time, all right? Remember the four or five membered rings with their nitrogens? And I can put a metal here, all right? So four of these come together and we connect them like this. It may have some foliage on the outside that has helped hold it. And then we put a metal in the center. We've already seen the metal of iron there. You put an iron there, it looks red. All right, it's gonna look red because it'll bind oxygen. If I put a magnesium there instead of an iron, I'm not gonna make hemoglobin this time. So when I put magnesium there, humans don't do this very much, right, at all. Uh, plants will do this very, very often. You put magnesium here, and these R groups are slightly different, of course, because it's made by a different organism and held by a different protein, right? This is gonna be chlorophyll. And so chlorophyll and hemoglobin are very similar. They do completely different jobs. This one's job is to transport oxygen, and this one's job is to split water molecules, right? So uh, this, this is quite different from the function of the hemoglobin, but mechanistically different, structurally very, very similar. Just put a different metal here. Let's change the metal again. Instead of being uh, green with the magnesium, it's going to look blue with cobalt there. So if you put a cobalt atom there, it looks like this. And blue, when it's really concentrated, looks almost purple, right, in this Buchner funnel. You've, you've used this in lab, I think, when you've made some uh, products and you tried to filter them, right? So they've made this cobalamin-bound protein here, right, or a molecule, and it's, it's filtered, right? So with a cobalt there, it looks bright blue. And you can put other metals there, too. They may not necessarily have as, as bright a color. You put manganese, it looks kind of pink, right? And nickel, copper, and zinc really don't give it much of a color other than a brownish color, right? But different metals give you different functions in that same structure. This is a metal holding cradle. Think of it that way, right? And depending on the metal and the protein it's attached to gives you different function.